Good evening. I call this meeting of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors for Wednesday, July 19th, 2023 to order. Thank you for your patience. We had a couple of technical things that we were getting ironed out, but those were handled. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. With that, we will move ahead to the roll call. Ms. Stevens. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Okay, here we go. Steve Odoricio, Adams County. I'm here. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Bill Holland, Arapahoe County. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Ashley Solzman, Boulder County. Austin Ward, City and County Broomfield. James Marsh Holshin, City and County Broomfield. <clears throat> Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marlin, Clear Creek County. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Yeah. Kevin Flynn, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Art, Jefferson County. Leslie Dahlkemper, Jefferson County. Yeah. Lisa Ferre, City of Arvada. Here. Dustin Zvonek, Aurora. Juan Marcano, Aurora. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Here. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Margo Ramsden, Bomar. Dan Plowski, Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Roger Hudson, Castle Pines. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Catherine Whitman, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Here. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Cheryl Wink, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Here. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. <clears throat> Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Rich Barrows, Georgetown. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Brian Desher, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Here. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherazai, Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Kyle Schlachter, Littleton. Kat Bristow, Lock Bowie. Jacqueline White, Lock Bowie. Wynn Shaw, Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck, Longmont. Here. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Deborah Fahey, Louisville. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Here. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Here. Richard Condo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. Sandy Hammerly, Superior. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. Julia Marvin, Thornton. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Here. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Present. Uh, Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Right here. All right. And with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Just a reminder to turn on my microphone. My goodness. Uh, just a reminder, uh, if you could uh, move your name tag so they are visible to the chair, that will help when we uh, go through conversation. So thank you very much. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, Director Whitlow, thank you. Do I have a second? second? Thank you very much. Any discussion? All in favor of the agenda, say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions, thank you very much. We have an agenda. With that, we will move into our first item, which is a public hearing. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steve Conklin, Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors. Thank mm -hmm. you for participating tonight. This evening, Dr. Connick is holding a public hearing on the draft 2024-2027 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, and associated air quality documents. This public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the documents I just noted to provide comments to the board. No decisions will be made tonight and no actions will be taken tonight related to the public hearing. But receiving public comment is important to the board's decision-making process. 
There are two ways to provide comments tonight, either in person or via Zoom. For those in person here tonight, anyone wishing to speak should uh, have either registered on the sign-in sheets or previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Fuck website or by phone. You can also raise your hand uh, to speak in person. If anyone on Zoom wishes to speak, please raise your virtual hand using the Zoom interface. If you've joined by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. When you're recognized by the chair, you'll be asked to unmute on Zoom. If you're on the phone, press star six to unmute. All comments received tonight, either in person or online, by phone or via email, will automatically be included in the public hearing record. Comments received prior to this public hearing via the online web map, email, phone, or in writing have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing tonight, please email it to the secretary after you speak. Board members, feel free to ask questions of those testifying. Todd Cottrell, Project and Program Delivery Manager with Dr. Cox staff, will now summarize the draft 2024-2027 tip as we move into this hearing. Mr. Cottrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And before I begin, I just wanted to emphasize what the chair said um, at your at your table, there are public comments received as of 5 p.m. Here, like that. There we go. As of 5 p.m. Um, this afternoon, these will be included as, um, as part of the public record, including any comments that are received tonight. So, as the chair mentioned, there we go. Um, there's three documents subject to tonight's public hearing, the draft 24 to 27 transportation improvement program, the ozone conformity determination, and the state greenhouse gas transportation report. Uh, and just as a reminder for the MPO boundary, um, the Metropolitan Planning Organization is different than the boundary for um, Dr. Cog, which is a, a little bit smaller. So the MPO boundary in which uh, sets who is eligible for TIP funds. Um, the TIP is a product of the MPO. Um, that MPO boundary is slightly smaller than the entire Dr. Cog boundary. Therefore, um, Gilpin, Clear Creek, and um, eastern portions of Adams and Arapaho are not part of this TIP document. Uh, this slide sort of organizes how we can become from a vision to a, a reality. And this all starts with the Metro Vision Plan. Um, the most important takeaway is that the TIP document itself and the entire process is not created within a vacuum. It relies on other elements, including the MetroVision and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. The MetroVision sets, sets the overall regional vision related to place, mobility, environment, livability, and vitality. Um, the Regional Transportation Plan certainly is federally required and sort of takes those transportation outcomes and guides those investments over a 20-year period. And it's organized into two different main sections when we look at the individual projects. Those vision projects, which is if we had all the funding in the world, this is what we need, but we can't afford all that. So we have the fiscally constrained list. This is essentially what we anticipate we can afford with the available revenues over that 20-year period. That fiscally constrained list is broken into three different sections. First, the uh, regional, regionally significant for air quality conformity projects. Um, there's also other projects which we have deemed regionally important, but that do not meet that definition for air quality conformity. And finally, there's buckets of uh, programmatic investments. These are all organized by what we call investment priorities, multimodal mobility, freight, active transportation, safety, air quality, and regional transit. I sort of bring the RTP into this conversation because that sets the base for what the TIP and the TIP application is based on. So the TIP implements that RTP. Speaking of the TIP document itself or what a TIP is, um, it's a short four-year planning program that outlines those specific um, projects with those um, dedicated dollars. At least for Dr. Cog, there's a new document that's created every two years. Um, most of the time, there's major calls every four years, and it doesn't just contain projects that Dr. Cog selects. It contains all projects um, that have federal funding, um, all state projects, including all of those with CDOT, RTD, and even local, local projects that are locally funded 
that meet that regionally significant definition. Dr. Cog has the authority to um, use four different federal funding types in one state federal uh, state funding type, the MMOF funding. And of course, this tip is not just a standalone document. Um, it is am uh, amended almost monthly through administrative modifications and amendments. When we look at the TIP program and the TIP document, there's what we would consider three major elements. The first being the funding allocation process. So this includes not only the, region, the regional and sub-regional share calls for projects, but also the set-aside programs. The graphic on your right indicates and outlines what that structure is for um, the funding allocation process. The second major element is what we would consider the sub-regional forums. A sub-regional forum is essentially each one of the eight counties within the Metropolitan Planning Organization, and then all of those cities, towns, and villages that are incorporated within those. And this is a way that um, Dr. Cog can really achieve that regional vision, but also interject those local values that each county may, may often have. Each one of those sub-regional forums also act sort of as a miniature MPL throughout that um, regional and sub-regional share process. And finally, the, other, the third major element um, of this program is the actual document itself. When we look at the TIP, we also have to look at federal air quality conformity because of the region and therefore the TIP and actually the RTP also must reduce pollutants based on our non-attainment status. And we're not looking at individual projects. We're really looking at this on a regional scale. Um, there's a lot of discussion earlier about the regional transportation plan. That also passed its pollutant emission test for regional air quality conformity when it was last adopted. Um, because there's a lot of emphasis on the regional transportation plan with those regional, regionally significant projects, those regionally significant projects must also um, be in the RTP and the TIP. Therefore, we can say that this TIP has also passed those pollutant emission tests. Uh, two to three years ago, there was a new state requirement for GHG emission reduction targets. Um, that also applies to new TIPs, very similar to the federal air quality conformity process where those regionally significant projects in the TIP must also be in the, in the RTP. And since the RTP passed its um, emission reduction targets or achieved all of those emission redu reduction targets, that we can also say that the TIP passed the, or met those targets as well. Uh, and finally, just wanted to conclude with what does this TIP really look like? Um, when we look at all the projects that are contained, there's over 190 intersections that will be improved for, for operations for all of the modes. Um, almost 100 miles of bike ped facilities are anticipated to be built. Um, we always have to look to the future um, because that's what those future projects are based on, is studies that are taking place now. So there's 34 studies that will prepare for those future improvements. 70% will implement con con complete street elements. 80% will improve connections to transit. When we look at sort of the place and where these projects are, 65% of them are near an urban center, 70% are on the high injury network, where it's projected over the next five years to reduce fatal and serious injury crashes. When we look at the TIP as a whole to conclude, almost a half billion dollars in Dr. Cog investment 2.2 billion overall for these four years. With that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my remarks. Thank you very much. And as a reminder, no official action will be taken tonight. This is part of our information gathering process. With that, the hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. Uh, if you have not finished by the end of three minutes, I'll ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask that you not repeat specific points made by prior speakers. A simple statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and appreciated. Commenters here in person will be allowed to speak first, followed by those joining via Zoom. Uh, Ms. Stevens will also have cards that help with the timing because three minutes sometimes go, goes by faster than you might expect. So uh, we will have, have assistance there. So do we have any testimony in person? Helmut?
And we have online Molly McKinley. Please go ahead. Good evening, can y'all hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Great. Um, good evening, Dr. Board Member, Dr. Cobb board members and staff. My name is Molly McKinley. I'm the policy director for the Denver Streets Partnership, which is a coalition of community organizations advocating for people-friendly streets in the Denver region. I'm here tonight to ask you to pause plans to fund the Pena Boulevard capacity improvements, pre-construction work, and instead fund projects queued up in Denver's waiting list in this tip cycle. There are a number of reasons we urge you to reconsider putting forward, um, putting funding towards the Pena Boulevard widening. The first being that, as y'all know, we've had a big shift in leadership in Denver this week, and Mayor Johnson deserves the opportunity to weigh in on whether this project, this significant, is aligned with his vision for the city and if it should move forward. Next, the Pena Boulevard master planning process is still underway. Moving this funding forward now would put the cart before the horse and undermine the process to identify what the corridor actually needs and what's in line with our city's values. Further, in light of the recently adopted greenhouse gas planning standard for transportation and new federal opportunities for investment in transit, widening projects like this seem out of touch and again seem inconsistent with state, regional, and local efforts and goals to address climate change and air pollution. Finally, there are a lot of projects on Denver's waiting list, including a number of trail and multimodal projects that could be funded for the same amount as Pena Boulevard. Um, they're just more clearly aligned with Denver's priorities and could actually improve the day-to-day -day lives of Denverites. We urge you to press pause on funding the Pena Boulevard widening during this final phase of the TIP process. Thank you for your time and consideration this evening. Thank you very much. And it appears we have no other hands raised. Give it uh, another brief moment here in room and also online. Are there any questions from the board? With that, this brings tonight's public hearing to a close. Thank you for your testimony and your interest. Action on this item will be brought before the board at the next meeting in August. So public hearing is closed. Control. That we will move ahead on our agenda to the report of the chair. Uh, I will just mention briefly all of you have information uh, at your seat in terms of <laughs> registration being open for the awards gala. Uh, also, help with sponsorships is very, very much appreciated. If you've got ideas, uh, if your city or another group you're involved in is interested in sponsoring, uh, we encourage you to talk to Steve Erickson. That guy right there. So I would encourage you to do that. Uh, one just real quick mention, I want to thank Director Wheel for visiting Edgewater last week. Appreciate you coming to the History Radio presentation. That was awesome. And with that, we will move to the report on a performance and engagement committee. Uh, and the chair, I know, could not be here. Did he designate someone to give a report on his behalf? Mr. Dyack, you look like you're just itching to... I'm not, but I'll jump in. Um, the Performance Agent Engagement Committee uh, discussed uh, a potential new policy uh, to allow uh, board members to. Wait a minute. Sorry. Um, we discussed a restricted hybrid option of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors, uh, and we're going to continue that conversation, I believe, in, in the next meeting. That is all. Thank you very much. Our report on the Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you, Chair. We had three action items for the committee tonight, and the following three action items. Sorry, try to get called. First one was a contract with Knox Software, DBEA, for a ride report for implementing a regional shared mobility data platform in the amount not to exceed $75,000 for one year term, with an option to renew for three additional one year terms. Second was to accept funds on to accept funds of 279. $1,347 from the Colorado Department of Health Care Policy and Financing for the period of July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024 to support doctors, Dr. Cog's Community Option Program. And last of the action items were to execute a contract with the Colorado Refugee Services Program of approximately $196,000 
for the term of October 1st, 2023 through September 30th of 2024 to support Dr. Cog's older adult refugees friends program. And we had a informational ad in by Sheila about funding the support and development of our regional housing assessment. And Chair, that is my report. Dr. Whitlow, thank you for the report and thank you for a great job uh, chairing that committee. I appreciate that. Uh, with that, we will move ahead to the report of the Executive Director, Mr. Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and good evening, everybody. I appreciate so many being here today in the kind of reaching that climax of uh, vacation, summer vacation, so we appreciate you all taking time to be here this evening. And I swear there won't be any hail. Oh. <laughs> Wait. Not, um, I'll do that. Your area, though, there, Director Vidham, I'm hearing some out in the eastern plains. But anyway, I want to first start with uh, regional housing strategy, something that uh, um, uh, Director Willow just mentioned. Um, we are we're moving we're moving and grooving on the on the housing strategy. Um, as you know, we you know we've we're moving at a pretty aggressive rate. We actually have an RFP out on the street right now that was published on July 11th. Proposals are due on August 3rd, and then uh, we'll engage with uh, with a diverse group of of folks. Um, to sit on a panel and ultimately select a consultant to serve uh, our our um, to serve our desire our scope for a regional housing strategy. Um, it's related, of course, to the UPWP amendment item that's on on your docket for tonight. Um, so, with uh, with with approval of that, which I hope is the direction we go. We'll be able to find a way to fund that thing, but we are looking at other alternative, uh, alternative and optional um, funding strategies as well. So, just so you know, we're, we're, it's all coming together. We are at staff level. Um, before we get a consultant on board, we've been busy putting uh, reviewing um, the housing assessments and housing strategy plans that your communities have done. We've collected all those now, and we're going through them. Then the kind of identify uh, themes as well as areas for regional collaboration. So staff is busy doing that, and I thank them for that. And also the next city county uh, managers forum, which is in August, August 10th, we uh, will be hope that meeting will be solely dedicated to to housing and and the strategy that we have uh, moving forward. So we just wanted to pick the brains of the city county managers. So if you could reach out to them and express to them the importance of them and this meeting, that would be appreciated. We did get a great turnout, but hey, it never hurts to have more. So thank you for that. Want to give you a quick update on the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy or the SED, something that you gave us all direction last month to proceed and. Uh, with uh, putting together on July 10th, we held our first leadership team meeting and we had a great conversation um, about what we would all collectively like to get out of that analysis. Um, and uh, I would like to share with you just the leaders, members of the board that are on that leadership team, because I think we have a great set of uh, board members as well as is great geographically, we have good turnout. So so directors Hazeman, Sandgren, um, Sherzai, uh, Teal, Ward, and Whitlow are members of that leadership team. So thank you very much for your participation. We're having a, our first in-person meeting coming up here August 1st, and uh, so we're excited to get going on that. Flo, thanks for all your work, and staying organized because we're, we're moving at a pretty furious rate on that. Uh, TLRC, the Transportation Legislation Review Committee, they have requested Dr. Cog present to them at their August 21st meeting. Um, two topics in particular, one related to our Way to Go program, our, tra our tra transportation demand management program, as well as the TIP. They wanted to kind of report it on the TIP and um, some information about our selection criteria and all that kind of stuff. So this kind of turned into an annual thing for us. So we're, we're appreciative of the opportunity to share the good work uh, that everybody's doing here at Dr. Cog. Award celebration, the chair has already mentioned that. Uh, please sign up and and uh, and reserve your seat. You get the good seats. You sign up early, you get the good seats. That right, Steve? <laughs> no, thank you very much. And just just a, a note that it is it's free for for board members. Um, so please do sign up for that. And I, again, I want, just want to express on the on the sponsorships. If uh, and if you have any leads, just send them our way and we'll follow up. But uh, we are we're uh, we're really really wanting to ramp that up. It's a little harder during the summer, we're found, to, to kind of get people really motivated for fall events. You know, we used to do this in the spring, if you recall, but 
we'll get there. Uh, bike to Work Day, we had a very successful Bike to Work Day on June 28th. Uh, we had uh, about 18,000 riders enjoyed, which well, I think we all would agree was a beautiful Chamber of Commerce Day. Um, 30, 390 businesses and 267 stations supported our Way to Go program, our team efforts. So a big shout out to everybody that participated and a big, big shout out to Dr. Cog's staff, our Way to Go team, for that coordination effort. It's, uh, it's a big lift every year and we appreciate you. 28% of the riders that participated based on surveys were first time riders. So that's about typical for us, about a third, which is, which is great. And that's really what we really strive to do, try to create in a fun and informative environment in which uh, people, you know, try something new, right. And, and hopefully it catches on and uh, they can utilize our bike system um, uh, more into the future. Um, also like to thank the many partners that we had. We, uh, um, in all of our jurisdictions, there, you guys have been wonderful to work with. We have business challenge winners as part of this. We had a competition amongst businesses, and the, the winners were, you may know some of these, Davis Partner Partnership Architects, uh, AMD or Advanced Micro Devices, um, La Sportiva, Validity Software, and Hydros Consulting. They, they were all selected winners of the Business Award Challenge, and they will receive um, what, Steve? Uh, recognition in the, in the business, uh, yeah, in the business, uh, Denver Business Journal. Um, last but not least, we just ended our fiscal year on June 30th, so you know what that means. It's audit time. So uh, Jenny and her staff are wrapping up, ramping up for that now. Uh, we've had some initial conversations with our auditing firm, Clifton Larson Allen and we'll uh, officially begin later this month and finish in sometime in September. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, one, one last thing I would like to mention, we just finished our performance reviews here at Dr. Cog, um, and I just want to let you know that the, uh, the merit increases as well as market adjustments that you all approved as part of our budget this year was very well appreciated. A lot of smiles going around the office. So no one has turned it back yet. So we're, we're very, very appreciative of that. So thank you all so very much. With that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you for that report. A uh, couple of housekeeping things real quick. Uh, if you haven't been to our meetings here before through those doors, hallway, there's coffee, cookies, and restrooms. Always good to know where that is. And if you parked in the garage downstairs, Melinda Stevens has the uh, parking passes to get you out of the garage, which is the other good part of that process. So uh, with that, we will move ahead to public comments. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. I don't think we're going to use 45 minutes on that tonight. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held. We just did that. Uh, consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have any public comments? Thank you. We'll move ahead to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda, which is the summary of the June 21st, 2023 meeting minutes? So moved. Second. second. Thank you, Director Bidham. We do have a second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Uh, moving ahead with action items. Uh, next, first up is discussion on the fiscal year 2022-2023 Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP. Uh, the amendment, Andy Taylor, Manager of Regional Planning and Development. The floor is yours. Well, thank you for your time and attention. Um, I'm Andy Taylor. I get to manage uh, the regional planning and analytics teams here at Dr. Cog, and I have a proposed amendment to Dr. Cog's Unified Planning Work Program in front of you today uh, for your consideration that would uh, first explicitly add housing coordination plan planning activities into our regional transportation planning process and allow Dr. Cog uh, to procure consultant services to assess regional housing needs and opportunities uh, beginning with the request for proposals that was released last week. 
Um, on the first point, uh, housing and transportation have always been connected. Uh, they're connected in our daily lives, traveling from home to work, uh, to school or other destinations. Uh, where we live affects the different travel modes that may be available or feasible for us and how far we have to travel to meet our daily needs. Uh, consequently, our approach at Dr. Cog has long woven this relationship into our planning work, uh, connecting growth and development and to infrastructure decisions back in our first regional plan uh, toward greater livability uh, in 1963. Uh, what's changed now is uh, language in the United States Code. Uh, last year, I presented at a board work session uh, that through the bipartisan infrastructure law, Congress added a key word uh, to one of the items that our transportation planning process must consider. Uh, they added the word housing uh, so that the process must promote consistency uh, between transportation improvements and state and local plan growth, housing and economic development patterns among other factors uh, in code. Uh, the one might argue uh, that housing was already implied uh, when it mentioned growth previously, uh, now it's rather explicit. On the second point, uh, this board has been discussing a potential regional housing strategy since its retreat in early 2022. Uh, and again, at this year's retreat in May, after a series of extensive conversations about regional and local housing issues. Uh, by adopting a resolution to amend the Unified Planning Work Program now, uh, related resources can be available so that Dr. Cog can, can continue to uh, work to procure consultant services, uh, under this activity for a regional housing assessment and take advantage of momentum around this conversation around housing uh, with aims for additional housing and transportation coordination activity into the next unified planning work program. Uh, yesterday, the regional transportation uh, committee did recommend adoption, but with one addition that was not reflected in your packet, uh, their recommendation uh, was to uh, make sure that RTD was reflected as a participant um, under this activity as well. And that's shown on the screen here. So uh, we're, we need a motion uh, to adopt a resolution uh, to amend the Unified Planning Work Program uh, to include this activity. I'm happy to turn it back over to the chair in case there are any questions or comments. Any questions or comments? I have a motion. Uh, Director Flynn and seconded by Director Wheel. Thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Attentions? No. Thank you. Um, moving ahead to our next action item, fiscal year 2022 Transportation Improvement Program TIP second year delays and Brad Williams, planner with transportation planning and operations will Thank you. I'm Brad Williams with Dr. Cog. This item pertains to TIP projects with FY22 funding that were delayed for the first time at the end of FY22 and continued to be delayed as of July 1st. The projects included within this memo are now considered second year delayed. As outlined within the TIP policy, if the second, if the second year delay is determined to be caused by the project sponsor itself, then the remaining unreimbursed funding for that delayed phase is to be returned back to Dr. Cog for reprogramming. <coughs> the sponsor may still continue their project, but the Dr. Cog allocated funds for that delayed phase will not be available. Policy continues to state if it is determined that the delay is the fault of another agency or due to an outside factor, the future course of action and or penalty is to be determined by the board. Your action may range anywhere from the loss of funding of the delayed phase to extension of time to initiate that delayed phase. That said, Dr. Cog's staff has reviewed the status of all project phases that received a first year delay in FY22 and has determined that five projects continue to be delayed to, to have delayed phases that were not initiated by July 1st. These five projects include, get them up for you. Uh, Inverness Drive West Bicycle and Pedestrian Facility sponsored by Arapahoe County. This was delayed due to right-of-way acquisition issues and unexpected permanent and temporary construction easements. 
Arapaho County has resubmitted the design plans to CDOT and extended the consultant contract to facilitate right-of-way acquisitions. Staff recommendation is to allow the project to continue with advertisement taking place no later than December. Second is Dry Creek Ops I-25 to Inverness Drive East, also sponsored by Arapaho County. This is delayed due to a longer than expected clearance process. CDOT has informed Arapaho County that uh, a submission of the construction stormwater permit is required. That permit has been submitted to the Colorado Environmental Online Services for review. Staff recommendation is to allow the project to continue with advertisement taking place no later than September. Third is Santa Fe and Mineral Oper Operation Improvements sponsored by Littleton. This was delayed due to numerous redesigns due to RTD and developer changes and the expansion of the original scope to accommodate other TIP projects. 90% design plans are being developed and expected to be ready for final review in September. Staff recommendation is to allow this project to continue with right-of-way plan submittal taking place no later than September. Next is St. Brain Greenway Phase 13, sponsored by Longmont. Delays are related to new hydraulics and floodplain modeling, resulting in a trail realignment. Phase one of the design for this new realignment is completed and phase two is underway. Staff recommendation is to allow this project to continue with project advertisement no later than May 2024. Last is St. Vrain Trail Extension, sponsored by Lyons. Right-of-way issues have forced the realignment of the trail, funding shortfall due to inflation, and design coordination with ditch companies have contributed to the delay. Currently, design is underway to realign the trail to accommodate new right-of-way alignment and the ditch, ditch issues, and Boulder County is now contributing funds to cover the shortfall. Staff recommendation is to allow the project to continue with advertisement no later than July 2024. Your agenda, agenda packet includes letters from each sponsor outlining additional information for these projects. I'll turn it back to the chair for questions. Do have any questions? Lizzie. Yes, thank you. I guess my question would be when, let's say, and I hope that everybody is able to meet deadlines, but if, for example, Littleton is unable to make the September deadline, does this then come back to us to make a decision or is it an automatic uh, removal of funds from the project? It's not an automatic removal. Um, we've never really account encountered a situation where there's an egregious delay beyond the second year delay, um, but we are flexible uh, for really any kind of um, options that come up in that time frame. Questions or comments? Sir, Director Lyons. Do we ever turn anybody down? Prove everybody all the What's the timeline doing? Well, I might start that just because I have more history. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I know there have been times when um, uh, you know, projects weren't going to make it, and 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 then members return the funds voluntarily before <laughs> that decision was made. Todd, is there anything? Were there any any other projects you can think of in your time? No, I think in the last <clears throat> 20 years there has not been a project where um, we've asked them to, con to continue without using the Dr. Cog funds. Um, it has either been a situation like you had described, or um, there has been a very valid reason, i.e. The, the fault is outside of their purview. It was CDOT, RTD, another company, a natural disaster, something like that. Yeah. The other thing I might, Mr. Chair, if I may, just uh, the point on that is like, you know, while COVID may be over, what we're finding with construction projects is that it's not over, you know, with regards to just the snowball effect associated with and the, just the backlog because of staff resources and everything, not necessarily even at the member local government, but within the uh, um, you know, within CDOT, within the various divisions or whatever, right? So it's, uh, yeah, it's a pretty unique situation right now. I, we're seeing less of it probably, Todd, than what we have in, in the past. Um, but, you know, it's still, it's still a problem. There's no doubt. I, I have a question. 
would it be correct that the two-year process that we have helps keep things online? And even though we end up approving just about everybody continuing, this is allowing us to move it ahead because there is that structure. How's that for a loaded question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, we are seeing improvements in terms of delays. Now, as Doug mentioned, COVID sort of threw a wrench in that where there was a lot of delays. So um, typically during that few years of COVID, we were seeing about double the amount of delays as we would normally have. We are expecting that to go down. To help that, we've also started a new project tracking that Brad is working on. So we are having monthly conversations with each sponsor of TIP projects to push things along or at a minimum at least have contact so that if there's anything that comes up, we can at least help address that if it's something that we have the ability to, to help with. Thank you. Dr. Shaw. Thank you. And I, I would add that um, that oversight and that collaboration that comes from Dr. Cog has really helped because I think we all know the value of the money and we don't want it to be, you know, prolonged and not used for a very long period of time. So um, keeping that eye on the ball as does occur with that interaction with Dr. Cog and the municipality or county is important. Mr. Teal. So I'll throw in a little history in my opinion. I think our switching to the regional, sub-regional uh, funding uh, methodology uh, helps us out a lot because we used to, I think about my early years on the board, we used to hear these and it was, well, we can't proceed if we don't get these funds in. And I think by going to the regional, sub-regional plan where we're working together uh, as sub-regionals, you know, it's not money from heaven anymore. It's you have an appreciation that, you know, you, you're working with your neighbors, you're working within your region in order to make investments that, you know, have those secondary and tertiary benefits through the entire sub-region. So I would, uh, I personally think it's gone way down. I can remember a time, Todd, when one, like one of your first times on staff where it was like a page, uh, the summary. It, it wasn't just our little block of five lines here. So uh, I give a lot of credit to the governance decisions we made a couple of years ago to switch to the sub-regional model. Great perspective, thank you. Other comments, questions, or a motion? Dr. Starker. Uh, thank you, Chair. I would like to move to approve the staff recommendations to continue each project and establishing deadlines for sponsor's project. I have a second. Second it. Mr. Hassman, thank you. And any further discussion? None. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Okay. <laughs> and and any abstentions? So with that retraction, that is a unanimous uh, vote in favor. So thank you very much. Awesome. And we move forward into informational briefings. CDOT Transportation Planning Region, TPR, Boundary Study, and Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations, will introduce the topic. Sir. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, members of the board. Thank you. Sorry, I said commission because I was at the Transportation Commission earlier this afternoon. Uh, apologies. Uh, Ron Papstorf, Transportation Planning and Operations Division Director here at Dr. Cog. For those I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, which is very few of you. Um, really, my, my part of the show this evening is to introduce Jamie Grimm from the Office of Policy and Government Relations at the Colorado Department of Transportation. Um, she is going to provide a briefing to the board this evening about 
the transportation planning region boundary study that CDOT is undertaking entirely across the state as a result of House Bill 23-110 that was passed this session. You, some of you might recall that bill was um, principally about expanding or extending the ozone transit uh, free fare program at the state level for local transit agencies around the state. And then there was language included in the, in the final version of the bill that directed CDOT to conduct this study, among other things. So we invited CDOT staff, James graciously here, to brief the board as part of their outreach efforts, uh, talk about what the purpose of the study is, uh, what's happened so, so far, their public engagement process, and next steps for that work. And as a personal note, uh, Jamie Grimm took over for me at CDOT when I left my position at CDOT. She's doing a much better job at it than I ever did. So, Jamie. Good evening. Um, this is my first Dr. Cogborg meeting, and you guys are fairly efficient. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Um, as Ron said, my name is Jamie Grimm. I have met many of you, but for those of you that don't know me, um, I replaced Ron and he did a much better job. Very big shoes to fill. So I'm here to talk about uh, House Bill 23-1101, the TPR study. I will do a quick overview of some of the language. Um, it was, as Ron said, uh, part of the Fair Free Transit Ozone Flexibility Program. I'm not sure that that was in the right order. But this is some of the language that was in the amendment. What happened in the provision is we were tasked with examining the consistency and transparency of the TPR planning process, uh, the boundaries of the transportation planning regions, membership in stack, and membership in track. Uh, we must conduct a study and have it turned into the legislature and the Transportation Commission by November 30th. And then they will be required to open the rulemaking process by June 1st of 2024. And that rulemaking process will follow a similar, um, as I'm sure many of you remember, the GHG process from about a year and a half ago. That sounds really long ago, but it really wasn't. Um, so. The Transportation Commission is responsible and can change the uh, TPR boundaries, the geographic regions. And so that's kind of one of the things that we're looking at is in terms of representation, as the state has changed, it, are people being represented appropriately in the TPRs that they currently are being represented by? Here are some of the things that the legislature asked us to look at as we were exploring possible boundary changes. Um, it's a very long list, and we have gathered a significant amount of data. Uh, we have put together a lot of maps, a lot of maps, with all of these data sets in them, um, and we are starting to disseminate those, and we will be sharing them with folks, and they look really pretty, but there are a lot of maps. So um, MBOs and TPRs. Obviously, all of you are in Dr. Cog, so you're aware that there are MPO boundaries and then there are non-MPOs, uh, communities within the TPR of Dr. Cog. So in the state, there are five MPOs, um, Dr. Cog, obviously, and then Grand Valley MPO, which is Grand Junction, Pueblo Area Council of Governments, which is the Pueblo Area MPO. Those two are really interesting because they are the county, the entire county, uh, their boundary is the county line. And so they have their MPO and then they also do planning for their non-MPO areas. Um, PPACG down in Colorado Springs, uh, somewhat similar to you, they are, they follow the MPO, but then they also, actually they're not similar to you, I'm sorry. They're all, all five of them are completely different. So um, they have the MPO boundaries, but then everyone who is in the COG boundaries is represented by the Central Front Range uh, TPR. So really this is one of those situations when we started pulling on the sweater, it just kept going. So um, it's getting complicated. Um, so as we're saying, so as we've said repeatedly, we cannot change the MPO boundaries. That is federal. It is as a result of census data but we are looking at non-MPO areas and TPR boundaries. And for you guys, the TPR boundary is the Dr. Cog boundary. Um, and then the MPO is within, within that. 
we have put together an advisory committee. We have uh, folks from all over the state, including Ron on our advisory committee. These folks are people, we're meeting once a month with them for an hour. And what we're doing as staff is we are taking our, our questions, our suggestions, some recommendations to them and saying, are we going in the right direction? We have taken um, kind of a little bit of our work plan to them and said, you know, we're going to look at A, B, and C first. Do you think that's the right direction to go? We took our uh, planned agenda for the public meetings that we have coming up and asked if they thought that we were forgetting something, if we needed to include something else, maybe take something out, what the right format was. Um, so mostly elected officials, but there are some um, subject matter experts, transit, things like that. These are not the folks that will be giving the recommendations to the TC. Those will be coming from staff. We're using these folks as a sounding board. So our study process, as I said, it's one of those situations where once we started, we discovered that we had a whole lot more things to look at than I think anyone realized we would. So at this point, we are deep in data collection. We have had two meetings with our advisory committee um, and what we took to them first and what we've been spending a lot of time right, doing right now is we're looking at the TPR, IGAs, and bylaws, how that works under statute, how that works under, um, under rule, what definitions are, what things maybe don't quite connect correctly in terms of statute. Is there something that maybe is somewhat vague that needs to be answered somewhere else? And so we've talked to them about what we're doing looking at uh, transparency and standardization of the planning process across the state. That is really what we have been focused on. Um, there's a lot of, I think, uncertainty around the boundary aspect of it and the possible recommendations there. Frankly, we haven't even talked about it yet. We haven't even touched it because we are trying to understand the administrative and legal requirements for TPRs to function as governing um, bodies. So. We have been working with the advisory committee. And then we also, um, hopefully many of you received it. We sent it out last week. We created a survey that we're disseminating around the state. Um, if you didn't get it, let me know I, or let Ron know and I'll pass it on to him. We are asking as many people to, as possible to fill it out. What we are hoping to gain is it's got three branches. One of the branches, it's kind of a, a choose your own adventure. So one of the branches is people who are really involved in their TPR, what their understanding of how the TPR works. Are they getting their minutes ahead? Are they getting their agendas ahead of time? Are they getting the meeting notes afterwards? Um, are meetings being noticed? How are they getting that information? Do they know who their stack representative is? Things like that. And then there's um, kind of a, I know a little bit about my TPR. And so we're asking them similar questions like, what do you know about your TPR? And then there are, um, I really don't know much about my TPR or the planning process. And so we're asking them some questions about, you know, how has your area changed? Do you think Colorado has changed? Do you, um, or do you know what the CDOT engineering regions are? And then also doing a little bit of education about what the regional, train, regional planning process looks like or, and how it, um, what some key documents are, et cetera. So um, please take the survey. Please encourage your stakeholders to take the survey. Um, we really just want as many people to respond as possible so that we have really robust data, quotes, numbers that we can put into this study when we make recommendations to the TC. We um, continue to make maps. And then we are going to be planning for our public meetings. I'm not sure if it's in this. Yes, it is. I've made a lot of PowerPoints in the past couple of weeks, and I have completely lost track of what is in which PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so we have a series of virtual meetings coming up. We are going to be doing five virtual public meetings. Anyone can go to any of the five, but each meeting will be focused on a CDOT engineering region. So Dr. Cog, you guys are obviously in region one, some of you. Some of you are in region four if you're up in the Boulder area. And um, we're also going to be doing two, three, you know, the whole state. And so these are the meetings that pertain to you guys, most likely. And they're going to be from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. 
on, let's see, Region 1 is on August 2nd, and Region 4 is on July 31st. Um, we, if you Google CDOT TPR, it'll take you to our regional planning page, and all of the registration links are there for the meetings. We also can forward you the invitation email. Um, we hope you'll join us. We, um, we hope you'll join us. The more people, the more the merrier when it comes to public outreach, right? So these are some of the things that we're doing moving forward. We are attending meetings. We're meeting with stakeholders. We are attending all of the TPR meetings around the state. Hope, uh, ideally in person, it's getting kind of hard with summer, but we will be going to um, Eagle on Friday for Intermountain TPR. Um, Darius and I are going to Lamar next week for Southeast TPR. We're traveling all over the state to attend these meetings and really be hearing from folks as they voice concerns or suggestions about this process. Um, and then we will be doing, I think I, meant, I think I touched on all of these. So we're continuing to move forward. Please join us for the public meetings and fill out the survey. Questions? I hope I was efficient enough. Please let me know if you have any questions. Like I said, it's it's complicated. Any questions? Director Flynn. Yep. There we go. Thank you. Uh, could you clarify for me the number of rural TPRs is 10, and under the statute cannot, or under the, the bill, they, can, they cannot be reduced. No. Correct? Can they be increased? No. So it's going to be 10. It's just boundary yes. changes. So, um, so per statute, there's a maximum number of 15 unless a new MPO is created. If a new MPO is created, then MPO is created and it becomes 16. Obviously, that's not happening this time around. This legislation does require us to main 10 rural TPRs and then the five that have MPOs in them. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I got one real quick. It's probably more of a comment. Um, you know, I, the state had a lot of foresight in developing this type of planning process. I worked in four states prior to here, all with councils of governments, and we did not have this type of structure. So when I came here back in 2013, I was very surprised. And, and it, it is great to be able to have that level of collaboration throughout the state. I don't know. In Texas, did you guys have anything similar? No. Yeah, so this it, it's very unique. Um, what I, what I wanted to point out is that, yeah, it does get confusing, particularly at the, the TPRs that are also MPOs that they don't necessarily cover the same boundary as us here in Dr. Cogar. I will point out, though, that we're planning over the next couple of years to, to begin a process of looking at our MPO boundary. Um, we're really required to do that by, by federal law every so often, and we typically do it, you know, after the decennial census and we get the information back and everything. And just, you know, so you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the coming years, but it's, um, you know, primarily what drives that boundary is that you have to have at least what is currently urbanized or is deemed to become urbanized over the next 20 years. And um, but there are some obviously some other variables and uh, considerations to that. But you'll be seeing more of that in the coming coming years. Thank you. Questions, comments? Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, I'll call your attention to informational item in the packet: administrative modifications to the 2023-2025 transportation improvement program (TIP) uh, and. Uh, that is informational. You can take a read on that at your convenience, correct? Uh, we'll move into committee reports. The chair requests these reports be brief, reflect decisions made, and information germane to the business of Dr. Cog. We'll start with the report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Mr. Nicholas Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll keep the uh, report here pretty brief. Uh, Stack did meet in July. 
uh, heard a number of items, uh, including what we just heard on. I, I won't touch on that. Really, the main event was the program distribution discussion. If you remember from our last meeting, uh, kind of had overview of this and talked about the transportation alternatives program. First up on the docket for for last for this month's meeting, uh, on there just as review, uh, the the transportation alternatives program or TAP uh, is for the implementation of non motorized or environmental mitigation projects. Uh, it is distributed currently at 50% uh, is based on population, with the remaining portion uh, being divided 45% by vehicle miles traveled, 40% by lane miles, and 50%, 15% by truck VMT. Uh, this funding goes straight to the local, agency, uh, local agencies, not MPOs, not DOTs. Uh, after some uh, lengthy discussion, mostly because of technical difficulties, uh, ultimately the, the stack uh, voted to recommend uh, maintaining that current program distribution uh, on there and really kind of based on a on uh, number of different factors feel like that was the most favorable outcome for Dr. Cog. Uh, also heard, uh, I'm sorry, real quick, the next uh, item will be uh, blessedly in person uh, and we'll be discussing the regional priority program. Uh, just some quick updates also on the state's aeronautic program, update from uh, NHTSA on grant opportunities, uh, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move to the report from Metro Mayor's Caucus, Mayor Bud Starker, Director Starker. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the uh, caucus has not met since our last meeting, so we will not have a report tonight. Thank you. Well, that's quick. There you go. Uh, report from the Metro Area County Commissioners. Uh, Director Baker is not here. Is there another County Commissioner that can give a report from the Metro Area County Commissioners? And we will move forward. Uh, there is no report from the Advisory Committee on Aging and the Chavo Sanchez Warren is at a conference. We'll move then ahead to a report from the Regional Air Quality Council. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Two items of note at the last RAC meeting. Uh, the first was the approval up by the RAC board to move forward the four remaining chapters to the uh, 2023 severe ozone SIP. Uh, they, were, they would be moved forward to the state for their consideration. The other was um, a discussion and action taken by the RAC on emission control strategy recommendations associated with lawn and garden equipment. Um, and the recommendation uh, would, re it was a proposed regulatory requirement and they are pro prohib prohibition on the sale of gas powered push and handheld equipment in the non-attainment area beginning in 2025 and um, limitation on government and commercial operators use of gas powered push and handheld equipment in non-attainment areas during June and August beginning in 2025 for governments and 2026 for commercial operators. And um, yeah, those those were the two recommendations that were 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 moved forward and will be taken up by the Air Quality Control Commission. I will tell you that I did abstain from that vote because we did not have a conversation, or did I feel I had direction to make a to 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 cast a vote in that? So um, that will next be brought up. They are it's possible uh, they're going to request a hearing date in August. And with a possible uh, rulemaking, like you know, public rulemaking occurring in December, I think is is what the plan is. So there. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, report from E470. Director Mulvey is not here. Uh, Director Tayak. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, we had uh, we had a, a maintenance mowing maintenance contract. We had a 64th Avenue interchange IGA with RTA uh, Arda. Um, Adams County House. All right. I just want to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> and we did a capital. Uh, we, we we reviewed our capital projects update. Uh, we have two big projects going. We have our maintenance uh, relocation uh, going right next to our administrative uh, facility. We also have the expansion of E470 from I-70 to um, 105th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Report from CDOT. Darius Backbaz. Good morning. Uh, sorry. Good after, Good evening, uh, uh, Dr. Cogdor. You, you were planning uh, for a longer meeting, right? Yeah. Um, uh, a couple of updates, especially on a couple of raise grant awards that are awarded to the state. Um, in the Denver region, there was a $25 million raise grant award for the Colorado 119 Diagonal Highway Multimodal Improvements Project. 
And additionally, there was a $20 million raise grant award for the 6th Avenue and Wadsworth Interchange Reconstruction Project as well. Um, uh, today, we did have the uh, Transportation Commission meeting. Um, there is no meeting tomorrow that we had the entire meeting and workshop this uh, today where we had discussions on on the uh, the GHG report from Dr. Cog and um, the TPR boundary study as well as the uh, an overview of, of uh, South West Colorado's uh, projects. And we have a new director of our Transit and Rail Division, who is Paul DeRoser from RTD, who will be starting on July 31st. And that concludes my report, Chair. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move on to the report from RTD. Brian Welch. Thank you, Mr. Chair and board members. Any Swifties here? Baseball fans? <laughs> We, we had a big weekend. Uh, we probably, I saw a couple pictures from our security cameras at some of our stations, and we had a lot of activity over the weekend. We felt like we had done a tremendous amount of preparation, and from what I've heard, it went off really well, given the amount of ridership we had. So thank you all. Zero Fare for Better Air is going very well. We're in our third week of our first month out of two. And finally, the, uh, the board will take action Tuesday to approve, I anticipate, the fare structure. Thank you, Dr. Cog, for your support letter. This features equity, simplicity, and affordability. So you can look forward to that being implemented. The first thing to be implemented will be the zero fare for youth pilot, which starts in September. We have received permission from the Federal Transit Administration to do that for an entire year. So we're looking forward to seeing how that works out as well. That concludes my remarks. Now, driving down here, uh, there are lots of construction downtown. I don't know if anybody noticed that, but there was a fair amount. <laughs> um, got, got behind a couple of buses. There are a lot of buses. And I, I probably noticed more than I have at any other time because traffic was moving kind of slow. The, the, the flashing on the back of the bus from the route number to free. Yeah. That was awesome. And you probably did that last year, too. I don't think I was behind as many buses moving slowly last year. But I, I loved seeing the free message on the back of the bus. That was outstanding. Um, have good news for you. Not only are we giving you back some time tonight, but we're going to give you time back on August 2nd. The board work session for August 2nd is canceled. You're welcome. Oh. <laughs> uh, our next meeting will be the regular board meeting on August 16th. So we'll see you then. Any uh, other matters by members? Seeing none, I will just say thank you for all you do. Thank you for what you do in your communities. It matters. Thank you for what you do here. We appreciate being here and being a director on the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. Thank you so much. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>